Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. This is the Bloomberg Surveillance Podcast. I'm Tom Keen, along with Paul Sweeney. Join us each day for insight from the best in economics, finance, investment, and international relations. You can also watch the show live on YouTube. Visit the Bloomberg Podcast channel on YouTube to see the show weekday mornings from 7 to 10 a.m. Eastern from our global headquarters in New York City. Subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Spotify, or anywhere else you listen. And always on Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Terminal, and the Bloomberg Business App. Let's get forward guidance from Scott Croner with Citigroup. U.S. equity strategy. Scott, right now, Atlanta GDP is a stupid 4.2%. You know that number is going to come down. Governor Bailey's raising the growth forecast fractionally over in the United Kingdom. Are we just flat out misunderestimating or just flat out underestimating growth? Well, it's a really good question. So uh, let's see. So let's differentiate Wall Street from Main Street, right? So we're watching the Fed. We're watching what's happening with central banks in Europe. I will say, Tom, that right now, um, you know, in our global um, equity market views, um, we've been more constructive on Europe than we have the U.S. going into Q2. Why? The setup there is a little bit easier. To your point, you have improving macro trends. You have a central bank closer to pivoting and analyst expectations tend to be quite low still. So the setup there from an equity market traditional perspective is actually pretty good. Whereas here in the U.S., we're still wrestling with Fed timing, valuation, and so forth. Um, so it doesn't doesn't change our view that we think the equity fundamentals are quite strong right now. But we're still looking for that macro kick in terms of Fed policy and then how that translates into some of the fraying around the edges we're seeing, um, I think, with the consumer to, to give us a little bit more of a falling rate tailwind uh, that I think is still on the come, but not quite there yet. Scott, can you talk to me a little bit about your approach to European equities? I know you're long U.S. and Asia X China equities, but certainly with Asia X China, you're doing it on a currency hedged basis. Talk to us about how you recommend U.S. investors approach European equities. Should it be outright or on a currency hedged basis? Um, you know, look, at I, I tend to prefer it up, uh, outright. I think when we look at it, we try to take the, the currency discussion to a certain degree off the table. It's a little bit different when we talk about Japan. I think as, as far as, as Europe goes right now, I know we're going to be paying attention to currency effects and interest rate differentials. But what we really want to hone on here, hone in, hone in on is this nuance that the setup in, in Europe is a little bit closer to early cycle than we are in the U.S. So growth then. But, you know, I just have to take you back here to the U.S., Scott. I mean, let's take a look at, wow, what a pop by utilities over the last six weeks. Yeah. Talk to me about these rate-sensitive sectors, financials of pop. You're sensitive. A guy like you looking at utilities. I'm a little sensitive here. In the I can Monday, just see what you. Is it, it's Thursday in morning? Indonesian rupiah and dominion. <laughs> it's good. I like that. But seriously, in all seriousness, Scott, I mean, utilities have had some move here, and it is the rate-sensitive move here after after what we've seen by the Fed. Talk to us a little bit about real estate and the property sector. They've definitely yep. lagged. I think real estate's off 7-plus percent this year. It's the only sector yep. that's down on the year. Talk to us about U.S. real estate. Okay, so what we did headed into Q2, we, we made a couple of important calls. Um, the first was that we were expecting a broader market pullback. We lowered tech from a long-standing overweight to a market weight. But what we did at the margin was begin to shift our industry group and sector focus to bias in favor of those parts of the market that should benefit eventually from a change in Fed direction. OK, and essentially where that takes you is if the, if the mega cap growth tech part of the of U.S. equities is more sensitive to 10 year yields, which we believe is the case. The shorter duration part of equities, which is going to be utilities, it's going to be real estate, banks, most aspects of the consumer. That's where we want to begin to to push our positioning in anticipation of this eventual uh, peaking in in, in Fed direction. Scott, what do you see on debt issuance by corporations? I looked at some of the, the debt construction of some of our glorious generational tech companies. And it's, it's just stunning how few bonds, bills, and notes they own. Are they going to start um, issuing? 
Yeah, look at so um, lots of lots of discussion points here, Tom. The way we've been talking about this is that we have many unintended consequences of the hawkish Fed over the past couple of years, um, and and one of those un, unintended consequences is this mega cap growth cohort runs very low debt, very high free cash generation, and as many in many cases is running very high cash balances. They end up being a net beneficiary of of higher Fed rates. Okay. At the other extreme, you do have these sectors which are led by utilities and real estate where their debt maturity uh, cliffs or walls, if you will, begin to hit this year, next year into 2026. OK, so right. the, the, the the higher for longer Fed narrative is is going to be contrary to positioning there. But I do think that under the surface, in our view anyway, there there are some reasons for the Fed to begin to pivot. Among those is to avoid the risk of something else breaking. Right. That would probably right. be a function of higher rates for longer, particularly in that real estate uh, cohort of the market. Scott Kreiner, thanks for getting us started this morning. He is with Citigroup. Sarah House joining us on our tour of Spain. She's like, what did I parachute into? <laughs> Sarah House with Wells Fargo here. And, so, you know, we're having fun this morning, but let's get serious here. One of the great screw-ups post-pandemic, and I don't blame anybody because it was a medical crisis, is growth has been better than anybody expected. Governor Bailey just mentioned that in the Bank of England. Atlanta GDP now is a 4.2. It's going to come down. I get that. Why is growth doing better than the consensus? Yeah, I think there's a, a lot of reasons is I think we underappreciated just how massive the fiscal support was, where if you combine the main seven packages, it was 25 percent of, of GDP <clears throat> effectively. And so it just has a much longer tail than what we anticipated. Yeah. And then I think also just how stimulative monetary policy was, I think it's actually provided a lot of insulation to the rate, the rate hikes that we've seen. On a partial derivative basis, had the haves, as somebody said yesterday, those with assets, are, are the, on a partial derivative basis, has the growth and success of the haves totally outweighed half of America flat on their back? Yeah, I think it has uh, obscured that you do have a segment of the U.S. that is struggling a lot more, um, that we see it in terms of, you know, first couple of years, the, the bottom part of the consumers actually did pretty well in terms of not only the fiscal support we previously right. mentioned, but also the tight jobs market really benefited those lower paying jobs. You saw the fastest wage growth. Well, now we're, see, we're still adding a lot of low in paying jobs, but the wage growth in that sector has slowed markedly. And so you're not seeing the wage numbers keep up with inflation as much. And these are the consumers that aren't able to trade down. They can't skip the vacations if you never took them in, in the first place. And so it's really been a squeeze on this, but it's been offset by the fact yeah. your big spenders well, are still doing well. We live vicariously through Damien Sasser. <laughs> he takes the vacations for us. Well, Sarah, I find it interesting. Your response to Tom just there on why is growth stronger than we expect, it has to do with money to spy, with, with the monetary base, with all the stimulus that the Fed injected into the economy over the past few years since the pandemic. And you know, when I look at that and I think about that, I think about yesterday's QRA, the quarterly refunding, and I think about, you know, the long end of the curve and the taper and all of the things that might well be suppressing yields. Do you see a possibility as the taper continues that the long end of the U.S. curve could derail, could bear steepen? So we're still looking for long end rates to, I think, move lower as, as we move through the year and think that the yield curve will uninvert, but it's going to be more from seeing the short end rates um, go down faster. Sure. And so I think when ultimately right. if, if we're getting a little bit better handle on inflation, not all the way back to two, not all the way back to two percent, right. but at least some improvement there. I think just the prospect of Fed easing will help in, in terms of what well, Damien just said there that Sarah pushed against folks. I'm sorry. It's part of the zeitgeist right now. Yeah, there's a whole school of thought out there. Oops. <laughs> what if yields pop out in a longer duration? Well, it seems like, you know, the Fed to some extent is managing, you know, the long end of the curve. I mean, we're not going to say there's yield curve is control going on here in the history, U.S. Is there any evidence that they are able to manage the long end of the curve? Absolutely not. And there's no evidence that they can do it today. I mean, that's the real gist of it. But, you know, nevertheless, we're seeing some things in the market that are just tough to explain, like growth. I mean, like, again, you know, and inflation, for that matter, not coming off as quickly as we otherwise expect. It's sort of mm -hmm. two sides of the same coin. So talk to us a little bit about inflation. We got the CPI print coming next week. What's your focus on that? 
Yeah, so looking very hard at, at core at the core, just given that you have had three months in a row of, of upside surprises, and we really need to see the core begin to downshift if you are going to keep even the potential of, of even a September cut. On Owners the table. equivalent rent. I think we'll see some moderation there. That's so the obviously one. it's been it's been stickier and it's been I think slower to see that downward trend. But we, we've already come off the the highs. But I do think that there's further further to go as we move through the year. It's just a, a matter of the magnitude and, and timing. I think has been has been tricky to pin down, but the direction, I think, pretty pretty confident lower. Well, I think that's the real one, right? I mean, that's what the Fed's waiting for. And I think, you know, if you just look at Steve England or at Stan Chart this morning, you know, he's talking about the potential for OER to fall in the second quarter this year. And that might be what Chair Powell is indeed hanging his hat on. I mean, what else could Chair Powell be hanging his hat on? In last week's, uh, you know, meeting, he, he gave three scenarios about where the Fed's going to push rates and all of them were either on hold or lower. So no one seems to be talking about hikes. But then when pressed in the presser, he didn't necessarily deny that people aren't talking about hikes on the committee. Talk to us a little bit about your takeaways from last week. Yeah, so I think in, in ter- obviously Powell put, put a dampener on the possibility of hikes. I mean, I think you can't ever completely rule them out, but it does seem like there's a very high bar in terms of whether the Fed would actually step back in. I think the more right. likely scenario is you just see the cuts keep getting pushed out. Um, so I think if you do see inflation stickier, jobs market remain resilient, I think that's the more right. likely play where they're not sure exactly how restrictive they are, but they can sit and, and wait longer to, to feel the effects and see if there are long Lags. For Business America listening across the nation right now, what's the animal spirit, Judge? Where's nominal GDP 12 months forward? Yeah, so I think it's it's still going to be pretty strong. So Five-ish? Uh, I'd say probably closer to, to four and a half, four, four and a half. But if still, you still that's have two and a half, If you still have two and a half or okay, two and a quarter, two and a half inflation. And the then... Why are we so miserable <laughs> with four and a half percent nominal GDP? I the think Knicks it... are winning and we've got four and a half percent nominal. Explain. Knicks are winning, but the Hurricanes are down to two, two <laughs> games and none to the to the Rangers. So that's why we're a little depressed in Carolina right now. No wonder Scarlett didn't show up today. <laughs> you know why we're depressed? Because the Knicks are winning and you can't afford a ticket. No, Sweeney's yeah. the only one. But continue. Why? I, I think why does the nation feel so? Uh, there's a weight upon them. I think it, it still is the inflation environment where, yes, we've seen improvement in terms of the rate of growth, but prices are right. still roughly 20 percent higher than they were just four years ago. And it's still difficult to digest. Businesses and consumers are still having to think about their pricing decisions a lot more than than they were accustomed to only only a few years back. And so in some ways, it doesn't right. matter that real wages have have kept up if if it doesn't feel like you're 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 growing in terms yeah. of your wealth. Fabulous. Terrific brief. Thank you so much. Sarah House with Wells Fargo this morning. Joining us now from Providence, Rhode Island, Professor Schiller is at Brown University. She's one of our most popular, controversial guests. The right hates or the left hates her. That's exactly how we want it right now. Professor Schiller, I've got to look at the trial of the former president and something we've avoided like the plague. Does it help or harm him to have these events going on right now? Well, it's all about getting out on the campaign trail and also raising money for the presidential campaign and every day that he's in court um, and that the news media covers it, but but still that he's actually not out on the campaign trail. And of course, donors, do they want to be associated with him? I'm talking about the really big money donors. They haven't really gone full in for Trump yet. And I think these trials are a distraction for them and for him. So, OK, they haven't gone in full in, but the, the campaigns are coming up. I keep telling people that are removed from this. I said, don't be removed from it. It's the second week of May. It's coming quickly, isn't it? It should. But the RNC and the Trump campaign still have a very serious money problem, Tom. You know, they're spending a lot of money on Trump's legal bills. And that's not stopping anytime soon. Even if these trials get delayed, the lawyers are still on the clock. And Trump has been brilliant in getting both fundraising from his donors, but also the RNC to pay a lot of his bills. And that means they can't fund things like organizing, get out the vote, um, help their county chairs, and help Senate candidates in swing states. And those two kinds of campaigns, the Senate campaigns, the presidential campaigns, are going to be crucial to either side's victory in November. Professor Schiller, I'm just curious to get your thoughts on sentiments. And when I say sentiments, I mean, you know, the resigning kind of belief is if you vote um, Democrat, you're voting against Israel. And I'm curious to hear your thoughts on that. I mean, is a vote for Biden a vote against Israel? 
Well, I mean, I think President Biden's record is actually quite supportive of the state of Israel, but there is a limit for Biden. And he set that limit not only this week, but last week in limiting the actual shipment of particular kinds of ammunition and guns and bombs to Israel, saying, listen, we can't sanction going into a civilian enclave and killing another 15, 20,000 people. I mean, that's not possible. But, you know, it's May. As Tom points out, Damien, you point out, it's May. The American voter is going to turn their attention truly to this choice in September. Mm -hmm. And by then, we all hope that there are things are calmer uh, between Israel and Palestine and Gaza. And if that's true, then the attention will return to the things that are more conventional, like, you know, the economy, but also Trump's prior record in office. And that's what you should expect to see from the Biden campaign in the late part of this campaign is to go after Trump and remind voters what it was like the first time. Professor Schiller, I just have to rephrase that question. Is a vote for the Republicans, for Trump, a vote for Israel? Well, if you look at the rhetoric of some of the most ardent supporters today of Israel and the Republican Party in the House on, you know, anti-Semitism, on combating anti-Semitism just a couple of months ago, it's not consistent. So the Jewish community and the Jewish voters in America have to decide who they trust more over the long haul to be both pro-Israel, but also fight anti-Semitism, not just abroad, yep. but at home. And I think the Republicans still have a little bit of work to do on that. And last question, I think you, you just hit the nail on the head here with what's going on on our university campuses. And, you know, there's some talk about the tax exemption being repealed under Republican administration for some of these higher, uh, 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 Harvard, MIT. I mean, you know, if they can't keep our students safe, should they indeed get the exemption? What are your thoughts there? I, I always think geographically and um, in terms of party locations, there are also wealthy schools with big endowments in southern Republican controlled states. So I think there might be an increase in the amount of tax. But you can see places like Duke, for example, uh, Rice, uh, Wash U in Missouri. These are all Republican states. And those presidents of those universities are going to be lobbying against any kind of increase in taxes on their endowment. So I don't think it will be as sweeping right. as people think will be just because of geography and partisanship. Wendy Schiller, I, I don't want to go into the protests right now. We don't have time really to, to treat it fairly with your wonderful perspective. But just to simply compare and contrast, is there any analog to 1968 within what we're seeing right now? Yes, Tom, if, if most people could remember 1968, which most people can't now. I mean, that's the issue is that we just don't know our history well enough. But certainly the fact that the Democratic Party's convention is in Chicago, there will be protests and there will be a police response, no doubt, really gives people of a certain age a lot of shudders yeah. to think that this will give, just as it gave Richard Nixon the election in 68, that this will give Donald Trump the election. And I don't discount that possibility. So they're trying to prepare for that as best they can. Remember, you and I both know people over the age of 55, 60, they vote in the biggest numbers proportionally. So right. and they remember 68. You're so this is a real challenge yeah. for the Democratic Party coming this summer. You're the second person to bring this up in three days. And Wendy, let's go then to the media change. We don't have Dan Rather and Black and White TV and Walter Cronkite having a conniption as Huntley <laughs> and Brinkley lean back and take in the scene. Now it's instantaneous. How will that play out then in a beleaguered Chicago? Well, I mean, when you think about the, you know, Bull Connor and the cannons on civil rights protesters, that was pretty immediate. And that really swung the national sentiment. Um, you can certainly see you already see it among independent voters. They don't like chaos. And the Democrats have been saying, don't elect Trump. It's chaos. Now the Democrats have to explain their own chaos to the key independent voters in swing states that will give them or, right. or deny them the election. It's that group of voters, not the young people, that I think are the biggest threat to the Democrats in terms of vote losses. There'll be a quiz at the end. Professor Schiller, thank you so much. I'll study for the quiz. <laughs> Front pages, Lisa Mateo with a great list of stories. We do. I'll start with the New York Times. This was a good one. It's a program that helps Harlem students build their wealth. So it's from the Harlem Children's Zone, and they say they want to uh, uh, address the racial wealth gap. So they're giving students, thousands of students at its charter schools in Harlem, 
$10,000 each to invest. They eventually want to take this program nationwide. So here's how it works. So money is going to be controlled by professional money managers. Students will only be able to get that full amount when they're 25 years old. That's after they graduate high school. College also takes some financial literacy courses. The students who don't reach all those milestones, they'll still be able to get a part of the money, not all of it, but it can be used for wealth building purposes only, things like a down payment on a yeah. home, continuing education, or a business investment. And what's great about this, yeah. Damien, and, and I, I can't say enough about how wrong I was about this. Boy, does it work. We had a program at Bloomberg to bring Bloomberg terminals to colleges. Good morning, Sarah Yango yeah, no, on I'm the West Coast. And after the third time where she laughed in my face and said, Tom, this works, it was unbelievable well, how using the Bloomberg Terminal and like the Harlem program engages these kids. Well, Lisa, what I find most interesting about this story is that professional money managers are going to be doing the managing. I mean, yeah. who's that going to be? <laughs> it's going to be PTJ <clears throat> or, uh, you know, somebody else who's a little close. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just speculating. But no, that's a great program and, and they and do work. They do, you do agree, work. Would you agree with me the best part of it is they learn how to lose money? <laughs> that's well, the best you, part of it. Uh, yeah, well, learning, I think lesson. learning how to lose money is an important <laughs> lesson. I can. Let's buy Airbnb. That worked out this morning. Next. <laughs> oh, gosh. Speaking of losing money, seriously underwater home mortgages, they are starting to grow nationwide. What does this that is, mean? This is from Adam. So seriously underwater, close to 3% of homes carry loan balances at least 25% more than their market value in the first few months of the year. So that's seriously. So that's up to more than 2.5% from the previous quarter. Places like Kentucky, West Virginia, Oklahoma, Arkansas, that is the leading, leading yep, the southern states. One in every 37 homes in the U.S. What about the tri-state area? Finding. The tri-state area, not as bad, but it's more like the southern states that are starting to find it, find themselves in that situation. How does this clear? But how does it clear? Uh, your guess is as good as mine. Hopefully the regional banks down there don't have the same problems we had up here with CRE. I mean, a lot of people yeah. are saying with commercial real estate, okay, it's, it's separate, it's distinct and all that. We had some good guess on that, but I don't... Well, I don't. they moved a lot of that risk away from the regional banks, you know, and into the hands of, of consumers and homeowners, whether or not the banks have to get right. involved if things get bad remains to be okay. seen. Yeah. Next. Yep. And then um, you talked about the record-breaking heat, so I want to kind of play off of that. Yep. Vacationers, this is from the Wall Street Journal, they're actually changing up their summer vacation plans because of that record-breaking heat. So they're moving away from places like, you know, Paris, Pacific Northwest, and they're going to cooler places. So Damien, you have to change your, you have to change your vacation. <laughs> you have to go to Norway and Austria. Oh, that's I where studied in people, Salzburg. I love Salzburg. See, that's where more people are going. Sound of music. Less intense summer, cooler can temperatures. Can I have your life? <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> you can thank my mother. Oh, so Norway, have you been? Have you been? So I've Norway? never been to Norway. Okay, no. so Norway, Sweden, also. Finland. Southampton, England, those okay. are some of the popular Copenhagen. places. Copenhagen. Fairbanks, and, Alaska. How about Alaska? Oh, no, no, I've never been to Alaska no. either. I'd love to do a fire and ice trip. I went to Albany once. That's yeah, good. Close enough. <laughs> <coughs> Norway is, is great. I have Helsinki, I can't say enough about. It's Excellent. Great. See, i got to change up my routine. Okay, got to get to grab the parka here. and go. Um, okay, if you're scared to quit your job, this is interesting. There's a company who you can hire to do it for you, to handle that awkward situation. What, was, who's this for? <laughs> this is, <laughs> if you're ready to quit. Okay, this is actually happening in Japan. There's a company named Momuri. It actually translates roughly to, I've had it up to here. Um, you can let me know if I'm right, Damien. <laughs> but clients are paying them 70 to $175 wow. to like avoid the confrontation, that strain, like emotional strain, social awkwardness when you want to quit in person. Um, and these... Um, resignation agencies, well, they're starting to grow. So there's more of them coming around. The larger ones say they process more than 1,500 cases each in April alone. That's how many people are quitting. Um, the smaller ones, about hundreds, but they're saying that they're running three times higher than last year. So it's happening more. And the people who are quitting more are actually not the veterans, but they're the new grads that are quitting more. Tom, have you ever had to lay someone off? I don't know. You know, I don't think I have. You know, I mean, I I don't think I have the stomach to do it. I mean, I may I, I may be a client. <laughs> you may. <laughs> I, my father uh, changed in the week when he had to let people go. Oh. It, it was I, I remember he just flat out changed. It's it's I, I, Damien's question is really really important. If you've been out there before and unemployed, you know how it is. You know, it's yeah. a real tough thing to do. Yeah. Yeah. Lisa Mateo, thank you so much. Greatly, greatly appreciate this. This is the Bloomberg Surveillance Podcast, bringing you the best in economics, finance, investment, and international relations. You can also watch the show live on YouTube. 
visit the Bloomberg Podcast channel on YouTube to see the show weekday mornings from 7 to 10 a.m. Eastern from our global headquarters in New York City. Subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Spotify, or anywhere else you listen. And always on Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Terminal, and the Bloomberg Business App.